Hello. Maybe you'd like to freshen up under the waterfall? Oh, so now that you're queen, you think you can just boss me around? River, go take a bath. Yes, dear. But only because you asked me. Hello to all and welcome back into another episode analysis of Star Versus. And I must admit, these couple of episodes were just fantastic. And somewhat of a spoiler, I'm so glad that they decided to make sure Moon gradually regained her memory back within a nick of time. It kind of reminded me of Stanley whenever he too lost his memory in the Gravity Falls finale to an extent, but was able to get it back after explaining his path. I guess the reasoning behind why Moon couldn't snap out of it as good in the realm of magic was because they were surrounded by the magic. I'm pretty confident that was the main reason for their memory loss and not just the destination itself. The episodes make sure that we witness them playing with or simply touching the magic a lot in some way. Anyways, Moon is brought to the Monster Temple while also being chaperoned around Muni. And remember, before the incident with Moon had occurred, the last memory of Muni she had was with the humans and monsters absolutely despising each other. <laughs> I can't believe me. So seeing this result of change and having her years of rule also dwell on the tragic past of monsters, this must be a lot to take in. Plus Star mentions this within the episode. There's this new kind of chocolate called Carob? It's not very good. Hmm. Now if I'm not mistaken, it sounds like Eclipsa must have made the Snickers candy bar flavoring an official type of chocolate in Muni. Or that chocolate did exist centuries ago, but she simply requested for the chocolate to be redistributed amongst the kingdom. I mean, how else would she know about the candy bar being inside of the vending machine all those years? We finally make it to the Monster Temple, and Moon even realizes at first glance just how much better it looks versus the condition of how it was just last season. Moon is then reunited with Eclipsa, exchanged with a hug, but doesn't seem to have memory of Eclipsa saving Meteora, ending in the result of Moon's downfall. And Eclipsa seemed to be quite apologetic for the incident, those seemed to be like legitimate tears. Star tries her best to avoid Moon from learning about Globgore, and even goes as far as distracting her with things like guitar playing and Marco nearly dying... again... <laughs> Seriously, this place has a lot of stairs, holy crap. It's too bad because Star was only delaying the inevitable despite the fact that she was attempting to tell her after a while once Marco told her to go for it. But one thing is for sure, however, is that Star really has become more mature over time. She used to dodge away from her problems all the time seasons back. So once Moon is finally face to face with the King of Monsters himself, she's not as panicked as you would expect. Now, of course, she was somewhat shocked, but I mean, the dude was about over 50 feet tall. Moving on, they eventually have dinner together, and once again, they seem to be having some fine dining. To which Star realizes and is genuinely happy to see, considering the fact that she's used to unfortunate events unraveling, and all she wants is peace. <clears throat> Now this is when crap gets real. Even after hanging out with Eclipsa, jamming out with her, and having some nice conversations, she still does not trust Eclipsa. This was a shocking reveal, cause we're talking about a queen who witnessed hearing evidence of the MHC themselves being responsible for faking the butterfly family tree, the same one who admitted to understanding monsters and how they too would want to protect their young, and the same one who also said in this same exact episode, how having humans and monsters living amongst each other is different, but good. Or at least can be good. So why be skeptical about Eclipsa of all people? Does Moon still believe in her being evil after feeling the darkness from one of Eclipsa's spells course through her veins? This even had me having second thoughts about Eclipsa. Realistically, however, I still have faith in her. Moon in the end decides to take River along and build a tent, which I believe is gonna be the same tent we saw in the promo. By then, I'm sure that Moon's memory will be darn near top notch. Transitioning into the next episode, we have this abysmal title known as Swimsuit. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They literally titled it to this because throughout the entire episode, Marco is searching for a swimsuit to go to the beach with Tom and Star. <laughs> but here's the catch. 
It's not to mention that during this event to go to the beach, Eclipsa interrupts Star with a shocking revelation, which was that she asked Romulus to free Globgor, but of course he refused and so she trapped him. Okay, now Disney admittedly hoodwinked the crap out of me both during and before the episode's premiere. I mean, to purposely show the future picture of Star and Marco at the beach and presenting her attempt to live that memory. And by the way, just like how I assumed in my season 4 analysis, Star 2 believes that this will occur on a day where Tom, Marco, and Star are at the beach together while Tom is the one holding the camera. And once again, I totally believe that this is going to be occurring during the season finale, but hey, only time will tell. <laughs> Get it? Because this is about the future? Um. I'm not funny. But seriously, enough about all that. Let's talk about Eclipsa versus Romulus because, oh my gosh, what a bunch of five-year-olds, seriously. And when I say five-year-olds, I really want to mention Romulus on this, calling Eclipsa a mumin eater because her husband used to eat mumins before he became a vegetarian, apparently. <gasps> mumin eater, mumin eater. Crystal-headed tyrant. That's it. And I wasn't necessarily shocked by this supposal reveal because they actually mentioned this within the Star vs. Book of Spells book, but at the same time, one thing I never really understood was why didn't he just eat steak or, or you know, some burgers or something like that? I mean, surely that tastes better than human flesh or human flesh. And then there was the fact that Glossaric was standing right by Romulus just simply tapping on him playfully as if he didn't care about Romulus being trapped by Eclipse's dark magic. I mean, I understand that this guy is supposed to be all-knowing and he knows in the future maybe all things will work out to his plan or whatever, but seriously, wasn't he supposed to be one of his children or something? At the same time, I kind of miss Glossaric with him toying with everyone and everything because seriously, um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of funny. Now, one other thing that I also want to mention about Glossaric is the fact that he has the ability to be in more than one place at once, just like Hecapu. And you know, that really got me thinking just how powerful Glossaric can be since he is generally known to be the most powerful being in the universe, as said by Romulus himself. Now, one thing's for sure, he too was also the same one who had the ability to break Romulus's crystal in the episode Page Turner. And there was this one response that really got to me that Glossaric said towards Eclipsa once Eclipsa asked Glossaric how the status of Romulus was. Any progress, Glossaric? Progress? <laughs> I don't work for you. Poke. Now, I know that when Glossaric says, haha, I don't work for you, it's probably the fact that, you know, he's all-knowing and that he's the one that's over her in a way, but still, I don't know, it's just kind of weird the way he said it. And now that I have said all of this, how come Glossaric wasn't the one who freed Globgor himself if he can clearly break Romulus' crystals? That's all I have to say about that, because seriously, I mean, does he know that Globgor is evil? Does he not care? Or is he just being a jerk like he always is? But continue on with the episode analysis, let me just... Let me move on, that's all I have to say about that. Now moving right along with the episode analysis, we also are shown Eclipsa and Romulus going at each other once she finally frees him in reverse. And by the way, this is what the scene sounds like in reverse while she's fixing her spells. Yeah, I just found that scene kind of cool. I, I wanted to play it in reverse so you guys could hear it for yourselves. But anyways, moving on. We have both Romulus and Eclipsa calling each other names, and Star being the responsible teenager that she is, she breaks up the fight and is able to try to somehow help them out. But of course, that doesn't last because Romulus and Eclipso once again love arguing with each other, and so Star tries to break them up by fighting and trying to dodge all of their attacks. And so we have Star again using that fire magic without her wand again, using the bomb spell from Season 1 and the Season 3 finale, as well as her famous Narwhal Blast. Which results in Eclipsa and Romulus finally stop fighting each other, but then eventually one of the nipple demons from off of Romulus actually gets freed and is able to just escape from his nipple. So that's kind of weird. That's why we saw that in the promo. But then it doesn't even stop there. Eclipsa goes as far as using a spell that allows you to switch bodies with another being. 
And then she attempts to use Romulus's body to finally free Globgor, but yet doesn't do so because Star feels as if if she does this, how can she ever trust her? And that I believe is the exact same reason why Moon didn't exactly trust Eclipsa, for example. We even saw a perfect example of this back in season three before the butterfly trap episode where they were actually trying to go through security to go inside of this secret dungeon. Is this how you used magic? When there's a problem, you just mind your eyes. And just like how the Book of Spells and her chapter revealed, Eclipsa does stuff just so she can finally get things that she wanted done. And that is even if it has to include the use of dark magic itself. So Eclipsa agrees to switch back to Romulus after Star tries to talk her out of it and how undecent it would be for her to do so. And surprisingly, Eclipsa agrees with Star and says that the kingdom comes first before her being able to free Globgor. And I found that truly impactful because if Eclipsa truly was evil, she could have just dissed whatever Star was saying and just completely free Globgor, who cares? And I bet if Moon was witnessing that entire scene, then perhaps she would have changed her thoughts on Eclipsa. And in the end, Romulus's mind still hasn't changed a bit and decides to refreeze Globgor and says that he'll never be able to be free again. Seriously, I feel as if maybe Romulus will actually come around to doing so some way, somehow, that's gonna be almost impossible, or Glosseric will try to actually help out for once. So, towards the and Star is finally reunited with Tom and Marco, who are the people making the boiling water as if they're going to the beach. But instead, not really, they're gonna have an indoor beach party since they obviously weren't able to make it to the real beach. And there's two last things that I learned from this episode. Star is a weird crier. Star, are you okay? And the title of this episode, Swimsuit, was literally because a swimsuit on a freaking monkey, even though the episode pretty much in its entirety had nothing to do with that title. So thank you, Dizzy, for deceiving me once again. You got me. I suck. I feel horrible for not noticing that you're gonna pull a fast one on me. So anyways, with all that being said, sorry guys for not uploading this video sooner. It's been a busy month for me, but I'm getting through this nice and easy, don't worry. Hopefully the next couple weeks I'll be able to make it up to you guys. But with all that being said, thank you all for once again supporting me with another episode analysis. And I will catch you all in the next one. Peace!